Australia is a big country. Australia is also a land shaped by wildfire in many places. Join me as we travel around this great country, meeting people and talking with them, and together their stories will come together and help us better explain Australia's complex relationships with wildfire. Welcome to Talking Wildfire Australia, my friends. Hi and welcome. This is Phil Cheney. He's a very famous fire scientist from Australia and I would like to introduce him to you. Phil, can you tell us some about your background? I was brought up on Phillip Island which is uh, between Victoria and Tasmania in Bass Strait. I was the son of a, a fisherman for Barracuda. I didn't know anything about fires or forestry and uh, I decided when I was about 15 that there must be something easier in the world than fishing. So I applied for a forestry scholarship. I graduated from Melbourne University and the Australian Forestry School in 1962. And I then, I joined with Alan MacArthur who was Australia's premier fire scientist. Uh, in about 1963. We worked for, at that stage, the Forest Research Institute, which was a Commonwealth organisation in Australia, and we provided advice to the state uh, forestry commissions or state forestry agencies across Australia. Uh, the Forest Re Research Institute uh, had a group called the Protection Group and I joined Alan MacArthur in 1963 in the Fire Protection Research Group. Alan had done a lot of work on experimental fires uh, and he was basically my mentor who set me on a path that uh, lasted me all my career and uh, I think helped me get where I am today. Alan was a, uh, an empirical scientist and that means someone who doesn't work to a, a, a predetermined theory but studies fires and correlates the movement of the fire with all the variables that he thinks would affect it. Uh, a fire is a, uh, a turbulent process. The whole principle of combustion is one where it's a turbulent reaction. When uh, hydrocarbons are heated, they start to break down in a manner where all sorts of chemical are produced on the way to producing carbon dioxide and water. The whole process of a fire spreading through the environment is a turbulent process. And so one of the things that MacArthur's style of research did, which he uh, impressed on me from the very first day I started working with him, was that if you wanted to learn about fires, you had to go and study them in the field at every opportunity. MacArthur used to carry out a series of small experimental fires in both grasslands and in dry eucalypt forests. These fires were lit at a point and they were allowed to spread for around 30 minutes, after which we'd extinguish the fire and then light another one. And in the course of a day, we might have done five or six separate experimental fires that started off in the morning and finished in the evening. We measured the rate of spread 
by placing metal markers around the perimeter so we could reconstruct the spread of the fire at two minute intervals and we set up a small anemometer at the base of the fire to measure the wind speed. We measured the amount of fuel or we estimated the amount of fuel on the ground and that was the surface litter and we measured the temperature and the relative humidity and the dryness of the atmosphere. MacArthur then correlated that data and produced uh, his fire prediction system which related uh, temperature, relative humidity, which produced a measure of fuel moisture content, the dead fuel moisture content, and that was related to the wind speed, which was measured by a small anemometer in the forest at the back of the fire. We would correlate the wind speed within the forest to a standard anemometer height used by the Weather Bureau of a wind speed at 10 metres. The MacArthur Fire Danger Rating System, he also developed from that. And MacArthur, because on each fire, uh, we either did it ourselves or we had forestry students who were doing a fire course would assist us during their summer exercise and part of their job was to suppress the fire with hand tools or occasionally if we were lucky we would get professional crews to help us with the firefighting. MacArthur used his extensive field experience before he came into forestry and the fire danger rating system he developed was an expert system. It was his expert opinion on what intensity uh, fires could be controlled by different means. That uh, fire danger rating system lasted for 50 years and has only just been revised. MacArthur travelled extensively in the United States and Canada and he would bring back ideas that were being developed over there and often adapt them to his Australian system before they were published in America. Uh, he was entirely practical in his approach and that was what he convinced me to do. In the first year that I joined him, he told me, if again, if you want to learn about fires, you've got to go to fires, we map them, we draw them. So in 1965, I was sent down to the Snowy Mountains region of New South Wales to study the fuels in the forest. When a dry lightning storm went across East Gippsland and southern New South Wales starting a series of lightning fires, I called Alan MacArthur on the radio and said, Alan, do you think I should go and study these fires? He said, of course you should. If you're going to learn about fire behaviour, you've got to be there. Uh, if you're going to learn about firefighting, you've got to go and talk to the people who are fighting the fires and learn from them uh, as to how they go about it, what the dangers in their areas are and what their concerns are. Now that advice is something that uh, I retained through the rest of my career and especially when I was leading uh, my own research into uh, much larger fires than MacArthur's original data set. I think when I look back now uh, I would, I would make a definite process. We'd get a major project, say we did one to uh, evaluate water bombers in Australia. 
Now, we had very fixed opinions about water bombers, uh, but we really wanted to test them out in the field and measure what intensity of the fire could a water bomber stop, but we also wanted to know what sort of intensity uh, firefighters could stop with hand tools, uh, firefighters with a bulldozer. And this is a very ambitious project. I would go down to, we selected an area in Western Australia and I would go and talk to the district forester there and I'd ask him, who's your best foreman in your field men? And can I talk to him for a day? And so I would get him to take me out, talk to me about the problems in his area, what weather patterns caused him concern, what were the dangers that he saw, uh, how did he go about organising his firefighting teams, and in that way not only develop an understanding myself, but getting a rapport between uh, my research team and the workmen who I was going to need if I was going to light large fires in the field to do the firefighting, to put the fires out that I started. I had a motto, I light them, you fight them. <laughs> so. And that worked pretty well because uh, we had a, a, a strong mutual respect and in that way I made sure that the people that I was working with were connected with the project. I would arrange with the department who was providing the staff to let me have them for a day for an introductory lecture of what the project was all about, what my part was, what their part was, uh, how many other staff were we going to have. And at the end of the project, I would gather them together again and explain what we had learnt up to this point and uh, that was a very satisfying process I think for both of us. Often the, the crews would come back at the end of a project and say thanks we learnt a lot from that, we didn't know we could do these things, it was a, a, a good experiment. So. We, I then carried out, we burnt fires in grasslands. We decided to, uh, had initially burnt a lot of small fires with Alan. I decided that after he retired and I took over, we needed to revise the fires with much larger fires. And we went to the Northern Territory in Northern Australia and lit fires in tropical grasslands. In northern Australia at that stage, uh, fires pretty much burnt 80% of the countryside every year. So uh, our biggest problem was saving a, an area, a significant area of grassland from being burnt before we got to it to burn it ourselves. But we were able to burn fires that uh, was spreading up to six kilometres an hour, the same process as MacArthur used by measuring the perimeter in terms of a grass fire every minute by throwing little metal markers with uh, crews around and uh, surveying, relating the speed of the fire to the wind speed in the forest and the temperature, the relative humidity and the fuel moisture content. When I analysed this work first up, I came to the astonishing discovery for me that all the fire spread of, all the spread of my fires on one minute intervals was independent of the wind speed. That means there was no relationship between how fast the fire was spreading and uh, how fast the wind was blowing in the forest. Now I'm not all that bright but I could recognise 
that there was no way that I could publish that result and be believed as a fire scientist. It was obvious that we had, there was something happening that we didn't know. Some of these fires were, uh, as I said, spreading at six kilometres an hour over a kilometre long. They were big fires. It was only some time later that we went back. I sort of kept that data, I put it aside. I didn't try and publish it, and something was wrong. So I said, well, I'll, I need to go and revise grassland fire spread in a more systematic way. So we created about a 2,000 hectare area of land that we had uh, in the Northern Territory. Uh, we divided it into 100 metres by 100 metres, or 100 metres, 200 metres by 200 metres. We would light a line of fire because our earlier work had shown that after a certain time when a fire got to a certain size, it tended to burn at a constant rate of spread. We went and we manipulated the fuel. We harvested some of the fuel off some of the blocks and took it away. So the fuel load was half the natural load. Uh, we measured the height of the fuel. We measured everything that we could about it. And we did a series of a hundred experimental fires on that block. When we looked at it, we found something that surprised us because the speed of the fire was indeed over a short period related to the wind speed, but also to the length of the ignition line that we had lit. Now, due to variation in the wind, if you light a hundred metres of line and the wind is not directly behind it, the head fire goes off at an angle and if you go at right angles to the prevailing wind, you can say, well, the ignition line is not a hundred metres, it's maybe 70 metres. And because I wasn't all that careful in defining the actual ignition line length, and that became a very positive uh, factor in determining how fast those fires spread was how wide was that ignition line when we lit it. And I thought, well, I'll go back and look at all that data. We had another hundred of those earlier fires that I'd lit from a point ignition, which there was no concrete result with wind speed, and said, I'll make an estimate of the width of the head fire as the fire grew. And it started from a point, and often you would have a fire travelling with a very narrow head fire with only perhaps 20 metres wide. And then with fluctuations of the wind direction, the fire increased in size and the width of the head fire also increased. And when we did this analysis, we found, yes, uh, the fire was indeed, the rate of spread was related to the wind speed, but it was also related to how wide the fire was at that point. And under winds of up to, say, 20 kilometres an hour, the fire would reach its potential rate of spread only when the head fire had developed up to uh, oh, around about 120 metres wide. Below that point, the fires could go at a constant rate of spread if the head fire remained narrow, say 50 metres wide. And this is probably the most valuable experiment that I did. And making that relationship uh, between the rate of fire spread, the wind speed, and the width of the head fire.
and whether or not it stayed at a narrow pointy head or where it, whether it developed into a, a broad wide fire. The speed that a fire now travels now depends on not only the wind speed, if the wind is calm the fire will be circular, no matter how long it goes it'll stay at the same rate, one or two metres a minute. If the fire remains narrow and say uh, the head fire is only 20 metres because the head is confined by in some way and it's often confined by the convective structure of the atmosphere, then it can spread at a constant rate under that wind speed, but that will be maybe 75% slower than the potential fire if the fire is allowed to develop a large head. Uh, it was a finding that was new. Uh, the finding was rejected initially by the uh, papers that I sent it to publish it in. Uh, but it was right. We, it, it passed all the statistical tests that we could apply to it. And although people disbelieved it at first, as soon as they tried it out for themselves, it was so obvious that it had to be right. <clears throat> In our analysis of the grass fire experiments, which included mostly fires from the Northern Territory, but also grass fires elsewhere, especially wildfires, uh, we found that when we corrected it for head fire width, that the relationship between the speed of the fire and the wind was a different relationship to the one that had been used by MacArthur. And his relationship was an exponential relationship. That's a relationship that curves upwards and continues to increase as the wind speed increases. We found that the relationship was not like it had a little kink at the bottom where a fire changes starting from a point, change from a backing fire to a heading fire, then and there was after that a little kink. From there on it was a straight line and so the fire was directly related to the speed of the wind. And then we decided, well, if that's true in grass fires, it is probably true in forest fires. And uh, the, but carrying out high intensity fires in forests is a much more difficult and dangerous proposition than it is in grasslands. And so that led me to my last major project, which was called Project Vesta, where we repeated the same style of uh, experiment, but had to do it in forests of where the fuels were of different ages. Uh, so they had been burnt on different years, so in this one we had fuel age and all of the measurements that we could do with uh, fuel to try and characterise it because up to that point there was no good statistical data which related fire behaviour to fuel characteristics. MacArthur had used fuel quantity of the fine material and that had been proven in wind tunnel studies in the US, the same relationship. But, and the wind study, wind tunnel relationships also gave a curvilinear increase with wind speed, which we said, well, no, that's not right. Um, but we needed the data. I started my last project, I guess, uh, in 19... 95. I'd always intended to retire at 60, which meant uh, 2000 was my retirement date. 
I had to extend that by five years because I didn't finish the analysis and the uh, writing up until 2005. Well, Phil, thank you for the talk today, and we all really appreciate your time. We're doing this for all of you. If you like what we're doing, please give us a thumbs up, hit the subscribe button, and leave a comment below. See you next time.